morning. If we haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Tyler. I'm the youth pastor here, and I'm so happy to be with you this morning, uh, just reflecting on what a blessing it's been as we've been in this miracle series, as we uh, get closer to the end of our series on miracles, just reflecting uh, even this week in conversations on the little things, on being reminded of what it means that sometimes the miracles of God don't show up exactly the way we want them to or expect them to, and yet they always show up exactly how we need them to. And I think one of the things that we can fall prey to when we talk about miracles, especially over a long period of time, and especially as um, those of you who are Christians who come to church regularly, um, we can kind of get this idea where we become familiar with things and we stop uh, remembering to be amazed by them, right? The, the pastor who uh, is now over doing ministry in Hong Kong named Francis Chan tells the story of how when he was young, when he introduced himself to his wife for the first time and got her phone number, he was so nervous to call her on the phone that he actually spent that whole day writing out notes of what his talking points would be with this girl on the phone so that he could keep her engaged and keep the conversation interesting and keep her wanting to continue talking to him and finding him interesting and he's like now I just answer the phone when my wife calls and I'm like hey what's up what do you need like I'm busy you know and I think with as Christians as believers I think we can talk about things like reconciliation or like Jesus erasing our sins with so much familiarity that we forget to be reminded of what those miracles actually are the way that God actually moves in and through those and so today we're going to be talking about that big word reconciliation and I, I pray that you just have a picture of a big uh, pink eraser in your head the whole rest of the of the morning but um, Webster's dictionary defines reconciliation reconciliation as the process of restoring to friendship or harmony. It's the process of bringing together two things or two people that have been separated. It's a concept that our culture values in romantic movies, right? We love it when there's a fight and then they come back together at the end and it's raining and they're like, I'm so sorry. And then they kiss and make up and live happily ever after. And so we love it in romantic movies, but then as soon as somebody says something offensive to us on social media, we don't love reconciliation so much anymore. Right? We, we have decided that reconciliation is a great thing in rom-coms and not such a great thing in real life. We've told people that the right thing to do is to strike back at those who hurt you or at the very least to not forgive them. And so we've kind of forgotten, I think, collectively as a culture, and this is not just the secular culture, but even within the church, I think we've forgotten what it means to be reconciled. And yet for those who are in Christ, we know that reconciliation is fundamental to the greatest miracle that the world has ever seen. I think as kids, we understand reconciliation better than adults, right? Like I remember when I was younger, we had this group of boys in the neighborhood that would play together, and um, on a regular basis, somebody would either break a rule to the game, they would make up a new rule to the game, they would say something mean, or likely in our case, they would hurt somebody, and then you would hear this phrase, right? And if you're a parent of young kids, you've heard this phrase probably multiple times before, you are not my friend anymore. And yet, probably within the hour, or at the very least by the next day, we were back outside playing kickball or playing tackle football with no equipment, just like we were the day before, right? But as adults, reconciliation, we make it a little bit more complicated, right? I don't know what it is exactly about us adults, but we like to make reconciliation a little more complicated, right? There are plenty of examples of estranged families that um, refuse to come back together. They remain estranged or separated because they refuse to be reconciled. They refuse to forgive. Interestingly enough, the United Methodist Church, right, the church that you are sitting in here this morning, um, would likely not exist if it wasn't for a type of reconciliation, right? If you go home after church today, if you're someone who cares about history, look up John Wesley and George Whitfield, and you'll see that in the early Methodist movement, there were these two men that disagreed over the doctrine of election, and it led to this very public split between the two camps that lasted for a 
few years, and it wasn't until they were able to be reconciled, not perfectly, right? They didn't always agree with each other, but they at least agreed to disagree, to be friends and to come back together, and that's what allowed the Methodist movement to continue to gain steam uh, in its origins. And so, uh, it wasn't a perfect rec- reconciliation, but it was better than, than fighting in the press, right? Back then there was no social media, so they would just publish stuff about each other's positions in the newspaper and, and talk bad about each other. All of this to say, I think we can easily fall into one of two camps, and maybe we fluctuate between the two. We've either at times forgotten how important reconciliation is as Christians, or on the other hand, it's become so normal to us that we forget to realize, to be reminded of just how amazing it is, how amazing it is, that we serve a God that has reconciled us to himself even though we don't deserve it. And now we have been given the task as his followers, as disciples, as those who have been brought back into union and harmony with God, we've been given the task of sharing that message of reconciliation to a broken and sinful humanity so that they might be brought back together with their creator. I want to dive into our passage of Scripture this morning on reconciliation. So if you have your Bibles, you can open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's verses 16 through 21. It's also going to be on the screen for you. It says this, So from now on we, from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he, was committed, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you're an underliner, maybe you just want to underline 2 Corinthians 5.21. That for me is up there with John chapter 3.16 among the best verses in all of Scripture. And you might be thinking to yourself here this morning, what the heck is the miracle in all that? If we're in a series on miracles, we've been reading normally from Gospels, talking about specific miracles that Jesus did. And we're going to get to the miracle here this morning, if you'll just bear with me. But I want to give a little context to where Paul is as he's arriving here uh, in this passage this morning. The letter that we call 2 Corinthians was not actually the second letter that Paul ever wrote to the church at Corinth, right? This was a very wealthy church in a very wild port city. Lots of trade would come through there. Paul had planted this church in Corinth. And then after Paul left Corinth, the church there began following some false teachers, some teachers who preached a message that was not the true gospel, namely one that made excuses for Christians to live like the rest of the people in Corinth. These people had come in and started preaching, like, I know Paul said these things to you about how you should live as a Christian, but actually it's not such a big deal. You can make these excuses for yourself over here. And they lived in this wild city, right? Think like um, Las Vegas, but with more water, right? or like Los Angeles maybe, right? They lived in this wild city that was characterized by all kinds of of debauchery, of crazy living. And so Paul, after finding out that the church had slipped into some of these practices, he writes 1 Corinthians, the, the letter that we know as 1 Corinthians, which was actually the second letter he ever wrote to that church. The first one has been lost to history. And he reminds the people there of the true gospel, of what Christ has done for them, and then he reminds them of how they should live in light of the gospel, right? And so then, after he writes this letter, Paul goes on a visit, a visit to Corinth himself because he finds out that they haven't listened to most of his instruction in 1 Corinthians. And so he goes there, and they have this big falling out. Right? He refers to it in his later letters as the painful visit. So he goes to the church in Corinth, says, hey, this is how you're supposed to be living, and essentially they run him out of town. They kick him out. They become estranged. And so he writes this third letter that's also lost to history. And he refers to that letter as one that's written with many tears as he implores the Corinthians to change their ways, to turn back to following God. 
So a church that Paul planted has now kicked him out, and he's writing to them, pleading that they would turn from this bad road that they're heading down back to following Jesus Christ. And Paul later finds out from Titus, one of his fellow workers who had delivered the tearful third letter, that the Corinthians had actually responded well to that letter and were beginning to turn back and listen to God. They were beginning to be reconciled. And so, what we have now as the letter of 2 Corinthians, Paul writes and rejoices in God for the comfort he provides in time of need and the hope that is to come for these Corinthians who are finally starting to turn back to the true way, to the way that they're supposed to live as followers of Christ. And then Paul would later visit the church in Corinth again and they would be um, fully and completely reconciled. So all of this to say that the very letter this morning that we're reading about reconciliation in was actually written in a context of reconciliation, that Paul had been estranged from a church, from a body of Christ that he himself had planted, and they had kicked him out, and yet now they were beginning to come back together and be restored to one another. And he writes us this passage on reconciliation, which I think there are three main focuses, regeneration, reconciliation, and then the ministry of reconciliation. Regeneration is just a fancy term for the idea of being born again. George Whitfield, the man who I referenced earlier, who was also along with the Wesley brothers, one of the main influences in the early Methodist movement, said, A man may go to church, say his prayers, receive the sacrament, and yet, my brethren, not be a Christian. The point is that to be in Christ means that we have become new, right? That as those who have been reconciled to God, who have been born again, we have to have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And something that breaks my heart, especially in North American churches, is seeing people go to church do things like say prayers in public, do things like take communion, and act like those things are what's going to save them, to give their life meaning and purpose. But Jesus didn't call us to go to church or do religious things just for the sake of making ourselves feel better. No, He came so that we might have life and life abundantly, so that we might be changed from the inside out and made into something new. That's what it says here in 2 Corinthians when it says, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. We get this picture of being reborn in John chapter 3 when Jesus is talking with Nicodemus. Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. He has this long discourse that makes it very clear that in order for somebody to see the kingdom of God, both here and now and in the heaven to come, they must be born again. In order to participate in what God is doing in the world is not just going to church, is not just doing religious things for the sake of being religious, but it's actually being transformed by the power of Christ from what was old into what is new. There has to be a change between the old and the new, right? There can't be an experience with the risen Lord Jesus Christ and not be a change, right? If you're the same, if I'm the same, as we were before we say we met Christ, then I don't think that we've actually met Christ. Because once we have accepted him into our life, our spirit is reborn. That means that there has to be some kind of a change. And so verse 16 in our passage this morning testifies to the things that are in us, the new things that make us to see Christ differently. Not only to see Christ differently, but to see the world differently. We see the person and work of Jesus Christ. We see his life that culminated in his death on the cross and his resurrection, not as a stumbling block like the Bible says the early Jews did, or as foolishness like the rest of the world does, but as the moment in which we were given life. Right? And that promise that or that um, accusation from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, I think it reigns true even in our life here today. Right? How many of us, if we stepped into certain spheres of our life, even among people that we would call friends, if we truly testified to what we believe about God, the fact that Jesus Christ was a real person who really did die on a very real cross and did rise again from the grave and defeat sin and death forever so that we might have eternal life with him that starts now and lasts 
into the age to come. If you really testified to the truth of what happened on the cross and some of your circles of life, people would call you a fool. That hasn't changed from the days of the Corinthian church to now. But we are called not only to see the world differently as new creations, as people who are regenerated, but to see Christ differently. Not just existence, not just the opportunity to be a a bag of bones that's here one moment and gone the next, but that this life actually has a meaning and purpose. We see Jesus not as a reason for pain as guilt, nor some foolish fantasy made up for people who are afraid to die. We see him as God sent in the form of the Son to be crucified, and that now we have been given this miracle that my old self that was once enslaved to the death of sin was crucified with him on the cross, and when he rose, my life rose with him. And now we're free to live and to see and to think and to do things differently than the way the world does because of what Christ has done for us and because of his making us new. And so when you're really walking with the Lord, he just begins to change you. He begins to give you his eyes for people and situations. The old has gone and the new has come. You start to see the anger in people around you and wonder what's hurt them instead of instantly getting angry back. You see the problems of evil in this world, and you know that it's not the way that it was ever meant to be. And that one day, God will restore all things to perfect unity with himself. The glory of Jesus will be so tangible to us in those days, it says in Revelation, that there will be no more sun, because the glory of the sun, S-O-N, will provide for us all the nourishment and light that we need. When you've become a new creation, when you've been regenerated, you see the world differently. When I was a senior in high school, I was being um, asked by some people at a prestigious Ivy League school that I did not go to, so don't think that highly of me, but I was being asked to come interview for a position in their class of 2022, uh, what would have been if I had, if I had gone there. And so I go to uh, a coffee shop in Iowa City, I meet with this woman who's an alumni, and she's interviewing me to get entrance into this Ivy League school. And we're sitting there, and I'm sitting there in my car before I get into the coffee coffee shop, and I'm thinking, like, God, I'm so nervous. What do I do here? And um, I, I get out my Bible because I just don't know what to do, and I open to a page, and I, I read Romans 1.16, which begins with, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I just, I read Romans 1.16 a few times, and I go, God, um, let me be bold for the gospel today. So I go into this interview, and I sit down with this, with this nice lady, and, and we're interviewing, and um, I can see throughout the process that uh, people in the coffee shop are beginning to listen to our conversation, right? Everybody else is kind of quietly reading or sipping their coffee, and and we're talking, and and I'm a loud talker, and so everyone in the coffee shop can hear what we're saying, and she starts asking me questions about why I am the way I am, like who, what makes you you, like what have you done in your life to become yourself, and I just can't stop telling her about what Christ has done in me, and she, and she says to me, like, I get it that Jesus is important to you, your faith is important to you, but what have you done? And I said, no, you don't get it. There's no way that I could have been the person I was and become the person I am today without Jesus. He is the all in all. He is the point. There's no me without him because without him, you wouldn't have me sitting here with you today. And so she said, thank you very much. And I shook her hand and I left. And I tell you what, I did not get into that Ivy League school. But you know what did happen? You know what did happen is as I was leaving the coffee shop, a man chases me out to my car and he says, hey, I was listening to your conversation in there as I was reading my Bible today. And the verse that I was reading as you were speaking comes from the first chapter of Romans and he starts to take out his Bible and I quote Romans 1.16 to him and he just looks at me. And he says, listen, I don't know who you are. I don't even know your name. I just heard you interviewing to get into college here in this coffee shop. But um, my spirit, my soul has been depressed recently because I've been having struggles with my wife. We just had a baby, but things haven't been going well. And um, I, I feel like I'm not living out my faith, my walk with Christ in my life, especially not in my marriage. And I just need you to know that hearing you talk today has given me courage to, to go live the gospel out in my life. 
And so sometimes when you're being reborn, the, the reason for that miracle is not exactly as you think it will be, right? And that wasn't all of the purpose in my own rebirth, and none of our purposes are, are isolated to this one singular moment, and yet the miracle is that in ways that I never could have imagined, God was using my story, my regeneration to testify to his goodness to somebody else. The second and the the point that we will um, end with this morning for time's sake is reconciliation. A broken and sinful people have been reconciled to a holy and perfect God on account of the blood of the Lord himself. Verse 19 says that God reconciled the world to himself, not counting their sins against him. See, his desire was never to be separated from his people. It was never the intention for you and I to be distant. And yet, because of original sin and the power of its nature over us, we were cast out from Eden. I wonder if you uh, are familiar with your Bible and if you've ever read Genesis chapter 3. Do you ever think to yourself, why did God have to kick them out of the garden? Or maybe more so, why did God kick them out of the garden and then put a flaming sword behind them so they couldn't get back in? I'm like, geez, God, like you really don't want them back in the Garden of Eden. Why? The problem is that they had already broken the relationship between man and God because a perfect, holy God cannot have sin in his presence, otherwise he'd no longer be holy. And so his holiness could not allow sin to remain in there. And yet God is also gracious. And in his grace, instead of allowing humans to live with the tree of life forever in the sinful, broken, separated state in the Garden of Eden, he had to send them out from the garden and not let them back in so that he could begin his reconciling plan for humanity. If God had allowed Adam and Eve to stay in the garden forever and live forever in sin, it wouldn't be so gracious that they were stuck in that position forever. And so he removed them from the garden that he might begin the process of reconciling his people to himself. That in his sovereign plan to bring humanity back into relationship with him in his grace, God chose the physical separation of Adam and Eve so that he could have the future reconciliation of us through Christ. They had to be allowed to die so that God's plan to bring his people out of their sin and back into life could begin. All throughout history, God's people uh, begin to wander away from him and then back towards him and then wander away from him and then back towards him. And so he began to foreshadow to his people how he would ultimately bring the world back to himself through Christ. But instead of forcing them to make the journey to him, like all other world religions, that you have to be good enough in order to get to God, he began to give these little inklings that he would someday take the step towards his people and bring them back to himself. He was going to go after them. His people, the Bible says, the church believers are the bride of Christ. He will do whatever it takes to be reconciled to his bride. Speaking of miracles in marriage, take a look at this video. The big miracle with me was with uh, my marriage. Uh, about 12 years ago, Amy and I were going through a really tough patch. Uh, she was traveling all the time, and I was home alone with the kids, and um, I was, you know, lonely and depressed and not communicating the best. And we were not working as a team at all, and um, kind of came to my wit's end. And uh, she had gone on a trip for work and one particular night we had a small I had a small group meeting and uh, I as always I was there early because those of you who know me I'm always early and uh, uh, sure enough you know uh, I walk into the, my small group and one of the small group people asked me a really uh, poignant question and I had to give a real honest answer and 
this person looks at me and says, Mike, how are you and Amy doing? And of course I, you know, just burst into tears and, um, and had to answer honestly, we're not doing well. And, and what this person didn't know was that I had planned to leave Amy that morning. Um, I didn't have a plan of what I was going to do. I just knew that I couldn't take it anymore. And whether I was gonna move me and the kids in with my mom and dad or what that was gonna look like, I didn't know. But, but God worked mightily and the Holy Spirit led this person to ask me that question, how are you and Amy doing? And I was able to tell them what was going on and they were able to encourage me and, and to speak truth in my life. And I think, but the biggest thing they did was made me feel not so alone. Cause I think when you're having problems in your marriage, you, you think it's just you and no one else has these problems and you can really become an island to yourself. And uh, anyway, so that was like the first way that, that God performed a miracle was by putting somebody in my path who, who made me answer a tough question. And then uh, the second miracle really was is far more powerful, I think. Um, a few days later, Amy came home from her work and we had a discussion when the kids went to bed. And at the end of the discussion, neither of us were feeling any better. <laughs> and, um, uh, and and I didn't, I didn't know what else to say. And I just said, well, I don't know what else to do. And I don't think our marriage survives unless God does something about it. And we both turned, we turned off the lights, we're laying next to each other in the dark, you know, broken and sad, not knowing what to do. And as we're lying next to each other in bed, in this really small voice, I hear Amy say, I'm sorry. And kind of in my pride, and you know, I, I said, we, I'm thinking to myself, you should be. And I didn't say anything back. Um, I wake up the next morning, I slept on it, I realized my error, and I realized what a jerk I'd been. And so I came to Amy and said, Amy, um, I just want to apologize. Like last night, I heard you say I'm sorry, and I didn't say anything back. And I just want you to know that I, and I'm sorry as well. And Amy says to me, I didn't say I'm sorry. You said I'm sorry. And we just kind of looked at each other. And she goes, I was going to apologize the morning this morning because I, I didn't say it back either. And um, only as God can do in the middle of the night, in the darkness, as we lied there, we both heard, I'm sorry, in each other's voice, and neither of us said it back. But the next morning, there was reconciliation. We both realized how important our marriage was to us. Um, it kind of fractured the shell that was around us. That wasn't the end all. That did not fix our problems, but it certainly put our hearts in the right place so healing could happen. And so I guess my message to you guys is that that A, you know, God can fix us and perform miracles physically, but he can also do it emotionally and in our relationships. And we need to talk to other people when, when we're having difficulty in our marriage. That's what the church body's for, is to help us and encourage us and to speak truth. And um, so maybe some of you out there right now are having difficulty and I just want to encourage you, don't let it get to a place like I, where I was gonna leave my wife. Yeah, reach out to somebody. We serve a, a God of reconciliation. You know, we serve a God who's also very serious about marriage. In fact, he uses marriage on a number of occasions in his word to point us to the relationship between him and his people, right? For example, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blame it blameless. And there's a lot that we could unpack there, uh, but for time's sake, we're going to move on to another, maybe less well-known time in which God uses marriage in the Bible to demonstrate something about himself to us. There was this prophet who lived about 700 years before the birth of Jesus in the kingdom of Israel. His name was Hosea. The kingdoms of Israel and Judah had split after the death of King Solomon. So God's people had split into two separate kingdoms. And the kingdom of Israel, that was the one to the north, was beginning to fall apart. And God calls out to this prophet Hosea not only to speak a certain prophecy about him, but actually to live that prophecy 
of God as demonstration to his people. You see, the people of Israel had begun to be led astray, and they're starting to believe some things about the way that love worked that I want you to hear because I think you might recognize some of them. See, during this time in which Hosea lived, it was common for people to believe, number one, that love was about the self, that love is about me, that one could have or feel love with inanimate objects, and three, that love was something that could be purchased with money. With the stage set, God sends this assignment, this interesting assignment to the prophet Hosea, It says in Hosea chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Beri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go, marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. I have to say this, every time I read this passage of Scripture, what an unfortunate name Gomer is. So Gomer, the prostitute, is the woman that God has called his person, his man Hosea, to go and marry and start a family with. And so that's exactly what Hosea does. He goes and he starts a marriage and he starts a family with this woman named Gomer. He pulls her out of the life situation that she's in and they have a son together and then a daughter and then another son and their, fa- their family's beginning to be established. And please don't hear what I'm not saying right now. I'm not comparing Mike Sells to a prostitute, okay? That's not what I'm saying, but I'm just using this as a picture. Then something happens between Hosea chapter 1 and Hosea chapter 3. And scholars kind of debate on what exactly took place during this time period, but essentially, Hosea wakes up one morning and he realizes that Gomer's not in the bed with him. And so maybe he gets out of bed and maybe he um, looks throughout their house and he searches for her and he tries to find her and she's gone. And and probably over a period of time, he comes to the realization that uh, he might be a single dad now, right? That his wife had left him. I wonder how he felt when, when he realized that she had left him. He was already a prophet, a holy man whose reputation would have been damaged by marrying her in the first place. How more would he be made to look like a fool in the eyes of the kingdom after his wife leaves him? He would be even more disgraced. But then God says, no, Hosea, the the point is not for you to be a single dad. That's not the message of this story. The message of this story is to show my people, my adulterous people who constantly turn their back on me and sin against me, how much I love them, how much I desire to be reconciled with them. And he says, Hosea, you shall go and you shall marry her again. And so Hosea probably has to go down to the the red light district to look for his wife. And you get to Hosea chapter 3, and essentially what happens is he walks in on an auction for her. She had run away from him. She had left the husband who brought her out of the terrible situation that she was in, and she ran right back to it, and she now found herself being sold as a slave. And Hosea storms into this auction, and he says, that's my wife. And I'm sure this is just me guessing, right? It's not in the text itself, but I'm sure the auctioner says something like, I don't care who you say she is. She's mine and she's for sale. And you know what Hosea does in that moment? He buys her back. Now we think that's crazy, right? Like Hosea, she's already your wife. Why would you go in and pay this exorbitant amount of money to free her from her slavery when she's already yours? And yet God uses this wonderful picture to say that even my people, my creation, who I have given breath and life, even though they would turn away from me, they would run away from me and sin against me over and over and over again, I will pay the price with my blood on 
on the cross so that we might be reconciled. Even though you're already his, he died for you so that you might come back to him. He paid the price for you just like Hosea paid the price for Gomer. Even though she was already his wife, he did whatever it took to bring her back to him. Isn't our God so crazy and loving just like that, or at least crazy in our eyes, that our Lord Jesus would come to live and to die and to be raised, to pay the price for our sins just so that we might be reconciled to God, the very God that we turned our back against in sin. Don't miss the miracle. Don't allow our our language of church to cause you to to not be amazed at what it is that God has done for you. That both in your relationships here on earth and your eternal relationships in heaven with the Heavenly Father, that there is reconciliation available to you through the blood of Christ. And maybe the most miraculous part of the whole thing is that unlike, I said earlier, unlike any of the world religions that tell you that in order to be reconciled to God, you better start doing enough good stuff and you better start running towards Him with all of your might, the very first step in your reconciliation was not taken by you, but it was taken by God when He paid the price for your sin. And so, brothers and sisters, finally, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation that our utmost job as disciples is to not go out and change the world through, through politics, through social activism, all those, those can be good things that are most fruitful endeavor in seeking to change the world for the sake of the kingdom is to preach the message of reconciliation to the ends of the earth because that's the only way things will ever truly change. I'll close with, with this. We talk about this camp called Summer Games all the time here. We, we love it, right? Andrew and I, Bailey, we, we love Summer Games. And I'll tell you what, Summer Games kicks my butt year after year. Like, like you don't get to see this, but we spend hours, hundreds of hours leading up to camp planning. We go seven straight days on about three to four hours of sleep with like 300 teenagers, It kicks my butt every single year. Every single year I find myself driving home, having to stop and buy a five-hour energy because I can't keep my eyes open. And yet, we go back every single year because every single year I get to stand in the back of the sanctuary because I, I don't have to lead worship. And so I get to stand in the back of the sanctuary and I get to look out and I get to see hundreds of teenagers give their lives to Christ every time. I get to see people brought from death to life. I get to see young hearts reconciled to their creator. I get to see them raise their hands and fall on their faces in worship of the Lord of the universe. And it makes it worth it every time. But that's not contained to summer games. You and I have actually been called to participate in that very thing each and every day of our lives in the ministry of reconciliation. And so I want to leave you with that verse that uh, was so prominent in my life during that season that I talked about a while ago and remind you that this ministry, this message of reconciliation, the miracle that's been done through Jesus Christ is not to be contained to us, but is actually to be taken out first to our community and then to the nations. I pray that you would be bold for the message of reconciliation from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so my prayer for you is this, this morning in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. I pray that you would not be ashamed of the gospel this week. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we do thank you and give you all glory and praise that you are a God of reconciliation, that even when we turned our back from you, even when we're unfaithful, even when we stray away from your good plan, Lord God, I ask that you would remind us of how great and glorious and miraculous it is that you have called us back into perfect union, into perfect harmony and relationship with yourself. Lord, we thank you for the great love that you have poured out for us on the cross, and we lift up to you gratefulness for this reconciliation and pray that you would make us bold for that very same message to go out to first our neighborhoods, Lord, to our families and to the very end of the earth with this one miraculous, amazing message 
that you have called your people back to yourself. And so, Lord, we pray these things in your heavenly name. Amen.